What is up, you gorgeous, fabulous creatures, and welcome to another episode of F to Scale Podcast. You're here with Kylie Pax, the Strider's Emotional Eating Coach, and I'm here to empower you to take control of your relationship with food, create a body and a life that is sexier than a hot fudge Sunday because you get to do it all on your terms. I am very excited to be here for number 81 of this F to Scale Podcast. Super excited and pumped. We've got a few viewer questions that are coming in now. So what I thought I would do today is uh, try and get through a few of them. Rather than just answering one for the podcast, I'm going to see how many I can get through and we can make this kind of like a mini masterclass. So as always, please remember a couple of small items. If you haven't headed on over yet to kyliepax.com forward slash free course, you can get all the information that you need with my free four part video series that is coming out any tick of the clock. Now to, I'm giving you everything that I did personally to lose 20 kilos and take control of my relationship relationship with food for life. And also, if you do listen to the podcast and you want to be shared and give me a shout out on social, feel free to take a screenshot of your listening to the to the episode and tag me so that I can share it in my stories as well. So let's dive into today's questions that we have because the first one that I have here is from Aletha Faye in Washington. And I'm going to grab my glasses. She says, hi, Kylie, I've been following your podcast and it's helping me a lot. Can you share your personal journey with weight loss and emotional eating? What were some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? So, girl, <laughs> I've shared my story many different times in many different ways. And so I won't go through everything here again today in this episode. I will tell you flat out no debate required. The biggest challenge that I had when it comes to proceeding and actually making progress with my breaking up with emotional eating and finally losing weight was self-belief. One fucking hundred percent. Like there's no doubt in my mind. And I really think that this is so relevant for so many of us. Self-belief is what is going to carry you through. If you didn't think the floor would hold you up when you got out of bed in the morning, you wouldn't get out of bed. And it's so similar with our lives every single day. If you don't really think that you've got your own back and that you are supporting you as you move through the day and make great choices with food, you're going to fuck, make fucked up choices. Okay, shall I say, you're going to fuck up your eating time and time and time again because you don't really believe that A, you've got your own back and that B, you can even do it. And what I mean by that is that we have proven to ourselves so many damn times that our word means nothing. When we say to ourselves, um, I'm going to eat really good today and I'm just going to lose this 30 kilos, I'm tired of messing around with that and I'm just going to do it. And then four hours later, you're stuffing your face with McDonald's and some Krispy Kremes on the way to the office or something. That is, that is not having your own back. That is not giving yourself a library of evidence that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do. So self-belief that it was even possible was definitely my biggest challenge. The way I overcame that was twofold. Firstly, I started educating myself on how the brain actually works. You've got to understand that your brain, it, well, okay, let me put it this way. Your habit center, which is where 99.9 .9 billion percent of everything that we do every day lives, your brain's number one job is to make your life easy and automated. Easy and automated, which would mean most everything you do, it doesn't want you to have to think about it because that's taking up valuable energy for which it needs for other things like your heart beating and so forth. So as many things as possible, it's going to slot away into autopilot in your habit center. And then when you decide that you want to make a change in some particular area of your life, it's going to look back on your little mental filing cabinet and ask, what did she do the last time this scenario popped up? So let me put it to you this way. This is easy to understand. The last time she told herself she was really done with this and she was going to lose the weight and she bought, you know, Subway salads and filled, threw out everything from the pantry and filled her fridge with like, fucking, 
spring water and and lettuce and carrots and the last time she did this she lasted about 45 minutes and then she was dialing dominoes so i can predict that's what's going to happen this time i might as well just start putting those thoughts in her head now and then we wonder why we feel like we're self-sabotaging it's because your brain only has its past history to go on your creative side of your brain, your inventive side, your imagination and your goals and your desires, that part of your brain, that is your prefrontal cortex. That is you, that is not your habit brain, the subcortex, which is squirreled away at the back, which is where it friggin' deserves to be. Your inventive and imaginative and conscious and cognitive part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex lives at the front, as the name would indicate, and that part of your brain is the part that wants to have this weight loss gone, that has the desire for it to be gone, but it's got to be working in tandem with your habit brain. Now, once I really understood how this worked, I stopped beating myself up for making dumb ass decisions because I started to understand my mind only has its previous behaviors to go on as a predictor of what I'm going to do next. So my job is A, not to beat myself up over the dumb decisions that I was making and my previous choices. That's not helpful. My job was to give my brain new evidence for it to be able to use and say, look, I do have evidence now that she sticks by her word, that she does what she says she's going to do, that when she says she's going to eat the damn salad, she does eat the salad. Even if she puts cheese and, and I don't know, crispy bacon and incredible things on it, she still ate the damn salad. Your brain is looking for a library of evidence and it's your job to create that for it. So how do you start doing that? First and foremostly, the fastest way to start believing in yourself is to start telling yourself believable thoughts. You telling yourself that you're going to clear out the pantry, never eat chocolate again, the chips are all going to just go and burn in some hell and you are going to eat carrot sticks for the rest of your life. That's not believable. That like, no. If you even said that for me, and I've been doing this a long time, I'd be like, you can screw that idea. I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want to eat carrot sticks for the rest of my life. But we live in extremes. That's again just human nature. We live in extremes. If one thing doesn't work, we think that we need to swing all the way to the opposite end of the scale because that must work. Like if having burgers and fries and chips and chocolate didn't work, well then surely eating bean shoots for the rest of my life must be what I have to do. I'm telling you. That is incorrect. There is a middle ground, which is actually where the progress is made. And that starts by you telling yourself believable thoughts, feelings, and actions that you want to partake in. Nobody wants to live on bean sprouts. That's bullshit right there. You're telling yourself bullshit and expecting yourself to believe it and then wondering why you end up face down in the chocolate cake because nobody wants to eat bean sprouts. You don't want to eat them. They're disgusting. They taste like lawn clippings. And I'm a damn vegan most of the time. So no, I say most of the time, because I do eat eggs, but I'm plant-based most of the time. Even I don't want to eat the damn, the damn bean sprouts. They're awful. You can dip them in as much salad dressing as you like. They're gross and nobody likes them. I don't even know why they continue to harvest them because they're vile. So tell yourself something believable, like I'm learning to... I'm learning to enjoy some new types of food. I'm learning to incorporate more fresh food into my daily routine. That's believable. That way, when you do make a choice that you look back on later and just go, oh shit, uh, I don't love that I ate 85 pizzas when I was only planning to have one tonight, you can tell yourself, but I'm learning to keep doing better and better in these situations. You're learning. That's step number one. Step number two is to ask yourself all the time because you're going to be in conflict with your food choices initially. Initially, because as we just said with the previous point, you're learning, you're learning, which means you're going to be confronted with conflict probably almost at every meal. Like there's going to be the, like the little, the voice up in your head, which I always talk about the voice, the voice. It's like the devil voice in your head. You've got an angel on one shoulder, the fucking devil on the other one. And the devil is like, eat the burgers, eat the fries. You deserve it. You've had a hard day at work. And the angel is like, but you promised this morning, you said you were going to have 
the broccoli stir, the cheese, cheese, chicken, whatever, the stir fry that's in the fridge, the Chinese and the fried rice, and that's still better than the other choice you were gonna make. You're always gonna have that conflict going on, at least initially. Two things I can tell you about that. First of all, don't be afraid that you're going to miss out on something. We were always like FOMO, 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 FOMO. I'm gonna miss out on the delicious food. If I don't eat it now, I'm never gonna eat it again. Again, not true. Regret has a far longer shelf life than fear. Don't make the shit ass choices just because you are a quote unquote afraid that you're going to miss out on some enjoyment. When I talk about the eating codes, which I do in my four part free video series, <laughs> kyliepacks.com forward slash free course, I explain each one of the eating codes in minute detail and, and eating code number two is where you decide what you want. You really need to take 30 seconds, if that's all you've got, that's fine, because that's all it takes, 10 to 30 seconds each morning to write down what it is that you commit to eating for the day. That gives you some guidelines and, and a guidepost to keep you on track. And the reason why I really, really, really encourage you to do this in the morning is because, said it before and I'll say it again, 6 a.m. version of Kylie has my best interests at heart. Nine, eight, nine o'clock at night version of Kylie could not give a shit. She doesn't care about my weight loss goals, my dreams, my desires, my wanting to have a, a slender toned body. She doesn't care. She just wants the KFC and the comfort food and the chocolate and the ice cream. She doesn't care. That's where using eating code number two and using your little, what I make a, a call it a simple daily plan, you write down your breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, what you are committing to eating for that day, what you intend to eat. And it doesn't say that you can't, doesn't mean you can't have something different or you can't make what I would call an equal swap. If you say I'm going to have stir fry, but now you want, I don't know, souvlaki, that might be what I would class as an equal swap, it's fine. What would not be an equal swap would be, I'm going to have stir fry, but now we're gonna go out for 85 kilos of greasy, cheesy pizza. That's not an equal swap. Not like, no, not even close, don't kid yourself. So when you find yourself in those moments of conflict, ask, if I wasn't sad, mad, or feeling upset at this moment, what decision would I make now? Because really, really, at the end of the day, you don't need to know in advance that what you're doing will work. You don't need to know that it will work. You only need to believe that you will do the work and you'll keep doing the work until it works. And that's the example that I am getting to know intimately at the moment with my gym experience. I joined a gym in January. It is now March, end of March. We're about to hit April. And I lost initially no weight for the longest amount of time. And I went every single day, did not skip a day. I did get hit earlier in the year with a, I don't know, we don't know. The, the test did not say that it was COVID, but I've never been so sick in my life. I would be surprised if it wasn't. And I, I was missed for three weeks. But from January to now April, I have not missed one day apart from the illness. And I lost almost no weight. Now, a lot of this, I will say, was due to, attributed to the marina, which I've spoken about many times, and I do think that that's what was causing the problem, which is why I had it removed, and here we go. I had that removed uh, probably, how well, I had it removed about 45 days ago, 45, maybe even 50 days ago now, and in all that time, I lost one kilo. I need you to really get this because I think about this all the damn time. This is such a teachable moment. I lost one kilo. I want you to think if you were eating all the right things, not overindulging, not emotional eating, not like really not mucking around with food, and you were working your ass off at the gym every day for 40 days, let's just go 40 days, and you didn't lose basically no weight, would you keep going? Because I did. I did, and this is what I told myself every single time I wanted to give up. I told myself it is impossible, impossible for me to do the right thing and not get a right result. That is not a thing. It's impossible for me to do the right thing and not get a right result. Guess what's happened in the last couple of days? The weight is dripping off of my body. I'm following the eating codes 
and it's now moving like nobody's business. And I do believe that, again, it was still to do with the marina, that the hormones had to leave my body. It probably took about a month, around that amount of time. That's that's my theory. I'm sticking with it until unless someone can prove me otherwise. But I could have easily given up in that window when it looked like nothing was happening. On the outside, on every scale in the universe and measuring myself with a measuring tape, it looked like nothing was damn well happening. But on the inside, cells were moving, hormones were changing, everything was fucking aligning and getting ready for the big breakthrough. I want you to really think, how close is your breakthrough? How many times have you been close to that breakthrough and you've given up? Because it looks like, quote unquote, nothing is happening. That behavior is not something that someone who really believes in themselves would indulge in anymore. I truly feel like we could wrap it up here, but I was so excited to do multiple questions that I'm going to throw in a bonus one from Missy in Sydney. And she says, hi Kylie, how can one distinguish between physical hunger and emotional hunger? Uh, do you have any tips that you can give someone struggling with emotional eating? Right, and I probably should have vetted this question before I decided I was gonna answer it because this I could talk about all day long, forever. Do I have any tips for someone struggling with emotional eating? Yeah. Let's start with how can you distinguish just, just how can you distinguish? How can you distinguish between physical hunger and emotional hunger? Very easily. Physical hunger is what I'm feeling right now. I feel like I'm eating my stomach, as Phil would say. I am so hungry. I haven't eaten since breakfast, and that was many hours ago, and that was a really light breakfast too. Plus I worked out at the gym this morning for two hours, like I'm starving, I'm, I'm beyond starving. So how can you tell what physical hunger feels like? It is, with, with all of that said, it's different for every body. It's different for every body and it's different for every body. Mine right now feels like an empty, hollow feeling in my stomach. Soon my stomach will probably start getting pains. Your mouth might start watering. Um, you can start feeling lightheaded or dizzy if your blood sugar drops too low. Sometimes if you work through the actual hunger, as in you're so busy in your life that you've worked through and missed that window where you did feel physical signs in your body, that can all sort of pass like a wave that, that sort of flows through the ocean. And now that may not return, but you could start feeling lightheaded or I'll start feeling a little unwell because my blood sugar has dropped too low. The physical sensations are usually there. We are, we are quite often not used to feeling them because we haven't let ourselves feel hunger in so long. With that being said, there are different types of hunger. There's three different types of hunger for you to be aware of. There's head hunger, mouth hunger, and then there's body hunger. So the first two, head hunger and mouth hunger, are purely emotional hungers. Body hunger is your physical body being hungry, which is what I just described. So let me go back to the first two. Head hunger is where you see something, someone says something, or you smell something, right? So you see an ad on TV, or somebody mentions pizza or burgers or ice cream, or you walk past a bakery and you smell how good it is. And that triggers you to want a particular type of food. You're not physically hungry. You know you're damn well not hungry. That is head hunger. After that, what I've identified is also a different type of hunger that I've never heard anybody else speak about, which is mouth hunger. Mouth hunger is a little different. You're certainly not hungry. You know you're not hungry. And you're not particularly thinking about a certain type of food. But what you want is a certain flavor in your mouth. I will very often be working in the afternoon and then see my mouth is watering right now because I'm so hungry. And then my mouth, I'll just want like the flavor of something sweet in my mouth. I'm not hungry and I'm not emotionally thinking of sticky buns or anything, but I just want to taste something sweet or salty or crunchy. And I wander the, to the pantry and I don't want heaps of food, but I'm looking for, do I just have a square of chocolate that I can just like, that sort of thing. I just want that in my mouth. I hope it's not busting anyone's eardrums when I do that. I just want that flavor in my mouth. You want a flavor, a taste, or a sensation in your mouth. That is mouth hunger. So they're the three types of hungers, and I hope that does help you distinguish a little bit what they're like. But I will say again around that, I mean, and around all of this, especially with emotional eating, where we start to think, 
I just need to eat now. I need this and I need this very badly. Our brain will, I mean, really, our brain will create fictional problems to solve non-existent disasters. Like our brain is constantly a problem solving machine and it's thinking if you just eat this now, that will avoid a disaster later. Like you won't get any because the kids will eat it. If you eat this now, you'll avoid being upset later when it's all gone. If you eat this pizza now while you're in Italy, you'll avoid regret when you go home later and you know you can't have it anymore. But it's not, it's, it escalates it way worse than that. It tells you, you better eat all the pizza now while you're in Italy because you won't be able to get it when you get home. The only regret you would feel over that is the amount of pizza that you have. Because I, I say this all the time, more is not better. More is just more. And you've really got to let that sink in. More isn't better. More chocolate isn't better than the first three, four or five that I had. It's not better. And I experienced this especially last night. I had red, tiny little red chiller chocolate uh, Easter eggs things they're small and they the caramel filled and i love them and i wait all year because you can only get them at easter time here in australia like it's a whole it's a thing i wait every year i buy the big bag it's 20 bucks and i've got no regrets and no shame i'm like this is my thing for easter and this is what i'm gonna have and it's gonna last me as long as it lasts and i have two or three at night every night with my cup of tea well, last night I had three. I said, I'm going to have two of these caramel ones. I'm going to have one of the little solid ones and beautiful. And I ate the three. They're tiny, like they're really small. And so I ate them and they were delicious. And then my mind said, well, if those three were that good, three more would be just like fucking amazing. And I really had to take a pause and give myself almost like a timeout. And I sat there on the couch and I don't say no to myself. Ever. I never say no. I can have anything I want anytime I want it. The only decision I need to make is do I really want it? Do I really want it? Because I had planned to have three. When I talked to you about eating code number two and writing down what you want to eat for the day, I can't even, um, like if you're listening to this on the podcast, you won't see this. But if you're watching this on YouTube, I had written it down for yesterday and I, I have it here in my journal and I'd written it down, I'm gonna have three chocolate eggs and this is fantastic. And I ate the three, which was what 6 a.m. Kylie, right? Angel version of Kylie had decided was gonna be good and I was gonna feel really good about, but fucking 9 p.m. at night Kylie wanted all the Easter eggs, all of them. Nine o'clock Kylie didn't give a shit about my goals, my weight loss goals, wanting to get rid of the marina weight, the work that I did at the gym, she couldn't care less. Didn't care. She just knew there was a big ass bag of chocolate Easter eggs that should be eaten right now. I gave myself the time and space. So here's another tip that I'll give you. I keep these Easter eggs in the bedroom, in Phil's in my bedroom. I don't keep them here in the kitchen. I don't keep them in the pantry. They're not far, but they're far enough that if I want them, I have to get up off the couch, walk to the bedroom, get them down from the shelf where I've got them. The reason I do that is, and let me explain, because I've done this sort of thing before many years ago, I used to try and hide food from myself. I would have my then husband hide the food so that I couldn't get to it. It's nothing like that. That is a different energy. That's an energy of fear and I can't trust myself. That is not where I'm coming from at all. That's bullshit and I will never do that again. I can trust myself. The eggs are here. They've been here for, I don't know, a week and I've only eaten three <laughs> in a week. So I know I can trust myself. I've given myself that library of evidence. And also, I'm smart enough to know that if I put them within arm's fucking reach, why would I do that to myself? A heroin addict doesn't keep drugs in their kitchen. Why would I, when I'm going through a hard time or I'm tired, just keep the food right there where it's easy for me to just grab and gulp, grab and gulp. I don't, I've done that before. I don't want to be that person. And it's not to say that I don't keep junk food in the house. I'm looking at the pantry now. There's a shit ton of junk food in there. But it's not the junk food that I love, like the red chili of chocolates. It's junk food. There's yogurt covered berries and, well, I don't know if you would class that as, that as junk, but there's Ikea chocolates and things that the kids love and, and chips and all kinds of things. They're not the things that light me up though. And I do that on purpose, again, because why am I going to fill my pantry with shit that is just tempting me all day long. 
some of those junk foods in the cupboard are just going to go off soon because I'm not eating them. The kids are not here all the time. Like nobody really cares. And what a beautiful, empowering feeling that is for me. Like, I love that because there was a time when I would stuff my face with any food that I didn't even give a shit about. Like I just didn't care. I just had to eat. So I keep these little eggies in the bedroom and I thought about it last night. I thought, do I want to get up and go get them? Because I can, but I gave myself time. I said, just wait a few more minutes. If you want to go get them, then you can. But in that period of time, I didn't just sit there zoning out in those minutes. I really reminded myself. And while you're waiting, just remember what you committed to this morning. Remember your goals. Remember, how do you want to feel when you wake up tomorrow? This is my biggest, biggest key to sort of snap me back into reality all the time. How do I want to feel when I wake up tomorrow? Do I want to feel like a piece of shit? Who, if we circle all the way back to our first question, does not honor her word, does not do the things she says she's going to go, that she's going to do, and does not stick by her damn self. Do I have my own back in these scenarios? I went all the way to bed last night, still in bed, and my that voice in my head is like, well, you're going to go to sleep now, so it's either now or never. You eat the eggs now or never. And I was like, I don't, you know, I just don't even care. I'm literally going to sleep. What's the fucking point of eating them now? I've brushed my teeth. You have to get up and brush them again. And I'm just not, I'm just not doing it. And I told myself, let me experiment and see. If I wake up tomorrow in deep sorrow and regret that I didn't eat the three extra eggs tonight, then I'll know that I should eat the extra eggs and that that's the best decision for me. But if I wake up tomorrow morning feeling fucking strong and proud of myself for not breaking my word, well... It's not hard to know which way I woke up feeling today. <laughs> I am sending you all tremendous amounts of love. As always, head on over to kyliepacks.com forward slash free course where you will get my four-part video series on exactly how I healed my hormones, broke up my relationship with emotional eating and lost 20 kilos for life. And if you have any questions and you want to be featured on an upcoming episode, please send them through to hello at kyliepacks.com or DM me over on Instagram. I'm waiting for you in the chat. Sending you tremendous amounts of love as always. Please remember the only person who has the power to change your life is you. When you step up and decide that the only person who can have your own back is you, that is when you've got what it takes. Have an amazing week, my loves. I will see you again next time. Until then, bye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember to shimmy your butt over to kyliepacks.com forward slash free course and sign up for my free weight loss training so you can start losing your weight now. You'll also find helpful notes and resources in my past podcast that will help you lose your weight without the BS diet drama. I'll see you next week.